Well, as Father Nectarius said, I'm quite far, far away in the town of Hamburg. And yet, Father found me. <laughs> and I don't know how. He had to tell me how he was able to find me. I, uh, I was surprised to be found, actually. <laughs> and my initial reaction was to say no to the client invitation. But I don't know why I decided to say yes. And I'm glad that I did it because it is a blessing to be here. So you've been wonderful to me, and uh, uh, I have to tell you my heart has grown a couple of sizes. So thank you. I chose uh, to focus on a peculiar thing this weekend, as it were. Well, the weekend has started, so technically it is. Namely on how we deal with our pain. And the title of my first walk, and of my first talk is the following. But you, O Lord, you gave up your price, which is Psalm 88, or Psalm 88. Life is the painful experience of the cross. Tomorrow morning's talk will be a continuation of this, it will be more practical than this. But um, the topic will stay the same how we deal with our pain. Why did I choose this for my topic? Because I'm convinced that one of the greatest difficulties of our life today is that we don't know what to do with our pain, with our suffering. In order to give you my opinion on this, by the way, I have to tell you a story, though. And half of my talk tonight will be in a story form. The other half will be much more uh, if you want, introspective. And the story is the life story of God. Of God, because our suffering in a, is an aspect of his own life. In order to give my talk, by the way, more strength, and I'm always looking for different strategies to give my talks more strength. Because see, that's what I've been doing for a living my whole life, talk. So I have to come up with new things all the time. I have to warn you from the very beginning that I will tell the story in a somewhat poetic form. It's going to resemble poetry more than anything else, because I want to tell it in a way which is unexpected. So what I'm after here is shock and awe. We hear the story, the life story of God, most clearly during Lent, as you know very well. More than at any other time of the year. Because it is during Lent when we serve the liturgy of St. Basil of the Great. And the liturgy of St. Basil of the Great tells the entire story. As the liturgy, this liturgy says, it, the life of God is tied to us. It is a life which I quote, brings about all things for us, end quote. In one word, God's love is one of condescension, or descent, of humility, or selflessness, and self-emptying. But I will tell the story by focusing on one element, an element which we will gather together from many of our texts, the scriptures, the liturgy, the fathers, but especially from Elder Emilianos of Sirenovita, from whom, as you will see, comes the substance of my talk. So if you have ever read him, you will recognize that I owe him everything. You will also hear straight quotes from his talks, from his teachings. The first thing the Lord did for us remains unnamed in the liturgy of St. Basil, by the way, but we know it from the scriptures and from many church fathers. The Lord went out of himself in order to create the angels and the visible world, the land, the seas, the sun and the moon, and all the other planets. In our theology, all these things were oriented toward the human being. They were created in advance, like a palace prepared for the king. 
in which humanity can be placed as a crown of all things. Therefore, says the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, after all things the Lord, I quote, formed the human being by taking dust from the earth and honored him with his own image. End quote. Of course, the words come out of Genesis 1.26, in which the Lord says, let us create the human being according to our image. What does this mean? Of course, the image of God is Christ, as St. Paul says, and as also the liturgy of St. Basil the Great says. But. So we were created after Christ. This means that in the creation of the human being, we assist at the making of an image of the image, an icon of the icon, the ultimate icon of divinity being Christ himself. In the human being, the Trinity, which is the ultimate iconographer, makes a little icon of its big eye icon. The human being is an image of the image, a little icon of the one true and only icon, of the one who puts forth in himself all divinity. In this icon of his own being, Christ saw himself. God looked upon a little God. As soon as Adam, the first human being, was created, the Lord had a sense of, ah, there is little me. And just like any icon in our churches, like all of this, because so, your church is so beautifully adorned with so many icons, and just like the one true icon, Christ himself, this little icon is made of matter, of earth, of dirt, of flesh. Yet, just like all of them, this little icon, the first human being, is also bearer of heaven. It is dirt bearing the face of God. And throughout the life of this earth and heaven icon, up to our present days, just like we take care of our own home and church icons, so Christ takes care of his icon, of every single one of us. He clothes it with light, he covers its nakedness, and cleanses when it gets dirty. And even when the little divine icon put itself out of paradise to which it really belonged, and exiled itself into, the, into this world and into them, Christ visited it in many different ways, as the literature of St. Basil says. Yet, after all these visitations, there was still one thing left for Christ to do, to complete the relationship between him and his icon, between him and us. And indeed, as St. Paul says, and also the literature of St. John the Golden Mark, Christ did not refrain from doing things until he has brought us up to heaven. This one thing left to do was to establish the relationship between him and his icon in eternity, beyond all visits. What was left for Christ to do was to come down and dwell within his icon. This he did, and he did so much more. He came to his icon to stand for all times in front of it, and to stand in a way in mirror it to his eye. He dwelled in it, he took its earth, its matter, its thirst, its frailty, its suffering, its deadness, so that in all things he is like it, or rather that he is it, that the entire life of the little icon is filled with him, so that the icon is in him always. And in this act, Christ made manifest something which has been present but hidden from the very beginning, something which is at the very foundation of the world. In his icon, God created something for him to bow down to. And this is the element I wanted to focus on, and it is surprising. As you know very well, an icon is not a painting, something to be looked at, and something to move us intellectually or emotionally, but something ultimately distinct and separate from us, because that's what a painting is. Rather, an icon is something to kiss and to venerate. 
It is not even something to be mentioned, but it is actually a space, a whole space. It is a room, meaning. It is the space of the kingdom of God into which we enter with our look and with our kiss and with our bow. A space in which we are first seen before we see. We are kissed and embraced before we kiss and embrace. So also the little image of the big image is from the very beginning an icon. The one kissing it and bowing to it, to humanity, is Christ himself. Christ, who is in this gesture, makes us the space in which he finds himself kissed and embraced. And through this entrance of the King, we, the human beings, are made into a kingdom. That is to say, we are made into the place which crowns the King. Christ is the one who liturgizes, who serves like a priest from all eternity. And from the very beginning of humanity on this earth, he serves as the priest of his icon. Short of this liturgy, which God himself is serving to the human being, the human being would not be an icon, would not be a space for its God, but rather something ultimately and always distinct from him, and would therefore have no true relationship with its God, but only at best a superficial communication from a distance. The Lord expressed this reality very sharply to Peter when the apostle refused to have his feet, his feet washed by him. The Lord said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, if I don't bow down to you, you and I remain strangers to each other. Here is an image of how this is, in case you wonder, how could this possibly be that God bows down to us? And it is an image I take from our daily life, so that this great mystery is easier for us to comprehend. A loving parent desires to have children, not simply for the act of having children, as if the birth is the goal in and of itself, but rather in order to love them, to kiss them, to give them his own life, as actually St. Basil the Great says somewhere else. The scriptures themselves use this imagery for what happens between us and our God. And I quote this out of the book of Deuteronomy. And in this wilderness which you saw, how the Lord God nursed you, like a man would nurse his son, along all the way that you went until you came to this place. This is also what it means to say that Christ came to his own, as the apostle John says. His own. What a beautiful and powerful phrase. Not simply that we belong to Him. Not simply that we belong with Him. That we are made in and for His presence. But this also means that He has set a relationship of love and kinship between Him and us. An adoring relationship in which He reveres us. Again, the Apostle John says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Although on closer inspection, the fact that God bows down to us is the story of his very ministry among us and the substance of the Gospels when we think about it. This is what the four Gospels say. They are just a long sequence of bow, bows and bows and bows that Christ is making to us. Although this is the case, it is still very difficult to comprehend this reality that God bows down to us. Right now, I will put things in this way, in a, as a matter of understanding, of comprehension. 
because it is simpler and it can serve in its purpose. Yet, tomorrow morning, you will see, I will tear apart this intellective approach. It seems to me that this reality can be grasped only to the extent to which we do not replicate within ourselves either one of the mistaken attitudes of the Apostle Peter. When this very act, the aforementioned bowing of God to him, was done to him, when God got down on his knees and washed Peter's feet. The first mistaken attitude, just to refresh your memory, although I, I'm certain you remember this event from the Gospel. The first mistaken attitude was the refusal. Oh, you will not wash my feet to the age. How radical it would. Never, ever. The second one, after the Lord convinces him to let things be, was actually the des a desire. Not just my feet, but also the hands and the head. In other words, this divine reality cannot be grasped as long as we stand firmly in the grip of our ego. Whether we view God through the lens of what seems proper to us, or whether we desire things which are holy and important to us. God's bowing down to us can only be taken in to the extent to which we struggle with and we wriggle free of our ego and we are seized up by His love. And there is one more thing which must be said now. The creation of the little icon by the great icon is worship, is liturgy, not as a fleeting moment, by the way, as a short-lived liturgical act, as if the liturgy would be given to us in pieces over time. On the contrary, at the very first moment when God creates us and bows down to us, Christ serves not simply a first act of many more liturgical acts to come. The liturgical veneration which Christ himself serves in the creation of his icon is the divine worship itself, the entirety of its substance, the substance of that which is still ongoing in our churches and in our hearts. It is what we, we just witnessed tonight in Vespers and will witness again tomorrow morning in Matthews in the liturgy. That's the substance of our worship. Not that we bow down to Him, but rather that He bows down to us. And this is why our worship is for all eternity. Because it is not grounded in what we do. It is grounded in how he is. Just like the epistle to the Hebrew puts it, the epistle that names Christ is the only true priest. The high priest and the sacrifice, the epistle says. The high priest who enters into the Holy of Holies all at once. That is to say, he enters once and he fills up with that entrance all time and space. Therefore, to put it differently in the words of the Epistle of, to the Hebrews, what we just witnessed tonight is the entrance of Christ. So how about our bowing down to Him, you may say? The poem is a poem. What about the reality that we also ought to bow down to our God? Isn't it, isn't this something else from his bowing down to us? It isn't. But nevertheless, we may have a sense that only we worship him, but he does not worship us. In the extraordinary mirroring of this indivisible, the divine and human reality, which our liturgy is, it may seem nevertheless that the liturgy is of our initiative and it is of our doing. It may even seem that only we worship Him. We are the only liturgical beings, not God. Yet, as the liturgy of St. Vincent says, He is first all things known. 
There is a second deeper reason, by the way, for which our worship is firm, for which our liturgy is certainly, certainly beyond the participation or non-participation in it of our hearts and our minds, of our attention. In other words, whether we pay attention to what happens here or not. The first reason is, of course, the fact that he himself has given us the liturgy. The liturgy. He has grown it as a thing most precious to him. Through it, the liturgy of St. Basil says, the gifts of Abel, the sacrifices of Noah, the whole burnt offerings of Abraham, the priestly offices of Moses and Aaron, and the peace offerings of Samuel. He has grown it through all the stages into the true worship, which comes from the holy apostles themselves. The worship which we do today in our church. Also with this gift, he has made the promise to fulfill all our prayers when we gather together. But now we can go deeper into this gift he has given us, our liturgy, and understand that the substance of this all is his own sacrifice. He's being slain from before the foundation of the world, as the book of the Revelation of Revelation puts it. This is why the liturgy happens without any doubt, whether we pay attention or we don't pay attention, whether we listen or we don't listen, whether our thoughts are here or not here. The liturgy happens always because it is his own life. Now, in order to get to our ultimate topic, what we do with our faith, allow me to go back to the point that God has centered his own story in us. Everything he is and everything he has done finds its purpose in us. You could put it this way, God has a singular focus, which is our hearts. As such, Christ bowing down to us needs or solicits something from us, which is true. And this something is also of our own benefit, not his. He has nothing to benefit from all of this. And that benefit to us is our health. This healing, our tradition calls repentance, as you know very well, which literally means in Greek, change of mind. Yet, what kind of change of mind are we speaking of? We are not speaking here of something intellectual, of abandoning certain ideas for others, of correcting our understanding, of embracing a different philosophy of life, as it were. We are speaking here of something which is much more fundamental to our life, which is even deeper than our own soul, of something which is essentially spiritual. We are speaking of a remaking of the self. Here is what Gerona Emilianos says, and this is a long quote. Our problem is not that it is difficult to find the passions that are in us, but that we don't want to find them. We don't want to know they are there, or that we are under the sway of such things, since this would make us feel as if the ground had fallen away from under our feet. This is because we have become dependent on a false image of ourselves that we have, and we hold on to it tightly in order not to lose it. And when you hold on to it like that, there is no room left inside of you for anything else. Then we are left to wonder, where is God? The answer is simple, simple. By holding on so tightly to our sense of self, we choke God, we strangle him, and we put him to death. But you might ask, can God die? He can die to us. He can be dead to each and every one of us. But can he rise again? Yes, when you change your mind, when you repent. When you do this, God comes to life within you. He rises up within you. And then you celebrate the resurrection of Christ. You are baptized again, you are born again. And you give him the right to take away your passions and lead you to a place of freedom. Of course, even though it is true that one can easily discover what his passions are, this does not mean that we are able to fight against them. 
This is not what St. Maximus says. Indeed, he teaches that freedom from the passions is something granted to you by God's grace, which comes about when you abandon yourself to the Holy Spirit. God will enlighten you to understand that there is a snake concealed in the grass, but only he can remove it. What then are you supposed to do? Change your mind. Change in the word repent. I've seen how the inclination of my will deceives me. I've seen how my desires and attachments distort my view of the world. Now, however, I follow the will of another, and I am doing precisely the opposite of what I used to do. This act of self-denial, which is the denial of my will, and in particular of the inclination of my will, is a basic presupposition for God to look upon us in mercy, and at some point to grant us the gift of freedom from the passions. And when we come to hate our lives in this world, and to bind ourselves to those around us in love, then God will grant us this gift. As a rule, though, we love ourselves. We prop up the idea of ourselves at all costs and refuse to see and accept the truth about it. But by seeking to maintain our notion of ourselves, we deny that we are in the grip of the passions. But if we do the opposite, we can make progress. As we said, it is not difficult to know what your passion is. Pay attention to where your mind goes. Either it will go to your passion, or to Christ, or to something else. It is not possible for the human mind to be nowhere. It has to grab onto something, latch onto something. And this something is what gives it a feeling of fullness and satisfaction. And this will either be God or something other than God." End quote. And he says the following about what happens to the mind in this process. Quote again. To what does the mind incline? To things that belong to the mind and to which the mind has been joined. In other words, the mind inclines to things that conform to its way of thinking, to its wishes and to its desires. What I desire, what seems good to me, what I wish for, something I think I have to do, because if I don't, the world will fall apart, as people say constitutes the turning of my mind away from God and prevents me from praying without distractions. Instead, the mind must be completely empty. All things must be removed from it. Everything must be submerged in the abyss of ignorance and oblivion so that the mind can reach upwards and can be seized by God." End quote. This change of mind which repentance is, is an existential crisis. It is a crashing of the self. It is a facing of Christ once I come to admit that my own self is something naked and inept and in exile from God. It is a turn away from my own self toward Christ. This change of mind, is something critical and radical. It is a terrible thing. As the Lord himself says, it amounts to the loss of my life. And this is in the Gospel of Matthew. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace by a sword, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. In front of Christ, everything I hold dear in this life of sin 
In other words, everything to which my ego clings, my accomplishments, my happy memories, my family, my usefulness, my desires, my plans, opinions, interests, and concerns, even my spiritual feats, my fasting, my prayers, even my struggle with sin and my desire for holiness, everything comes crashing down into a big heap of dirt. Given how difficult this crashing of the ego is, as much as I might desire Christ, genuine desire Him, I nevertheless spend my life avoiding this moment, this loss of my life. Like Adam and Eve, my ancestors, I decide to hide my wounded and frail ego in the thicket and to cover my nakedness with leaves. Thus, I am opting constantly for and reverting back to living in a psychological manner, in a frail ego shredded to pieces by wounds and desires. In a few words, I revert to a life of self-consciousness, a life centered in me, not in God. Of course, this life of lies can still be spent mostly in feeling good about myself, in contentment, in affirmations, in confidence, in self-esteem, even blissful self-esteem. Yet, all these movements of my broken soul are just strategies of endurance, covering up of self-doubt, self-judgments and self-condemnations, disappointments in the self, self-hatred and self-harm. This fragile life is only one comment, one look, one text, one disappointment, one difficulty, one pain, one Facebook dislike away from the deepest experiences of depression. Actually, the more the awareness of my frailty takes form in my miserable thoughts, the deeper I hide into the thicket of my ego. But if I decide not to conceal my nakedness, then I begin to live truly. Like the Lord says, then I jump into another universe, into another manner of being, built not around my own, my own ego, my own self, but around my God, who is revealed actually in the reality of my nakedness. The soul now truly begins its Christian life. It acquires the sense that it is a soul in exile. I quote the elder again. It realizes that it is something that has been cast away and now exists outside of its proper place, outside of paradise, in a foreign land, beyond the borders within which it was made to dwell. Moreover, in the words of the same elder, by the way, in this choice, I realize that I am a very small, that I am very small, I am a speck of dirt. Before God, I don't even have the height of an ant. I am nothing. I am a shadow that can neither advance nor shine. This existential crisis, this change of mind, is so radical and critical that, as I already said, I spend my whole life avoiding, avoiding it, more or less consciously or intentionally. Furthermore, I can spend my entire life, decades, in the church and in the faith without this happening. I can go to confession. I can shed tears over my sins. I can be moved by the words of the Divine Liturgy. And this crisis, nevertheless, has not yet happened. We may even think that we have a Christian life, but that is a delusion, or at least it is something very superficial. Only with the decision to accept that I am naked, I am powerless, and I'm in exile, do I truly begin to live. Because in that decision is found in the death of my ego. Now I have to emphasize, by the way, and I'll do this again tomorrow, especially in front of the teenagers, because this is a very important point. What I'm talking about here is not a psychological drama. It is not 
the same thing, by the way, that I leave behind my concealed life. And we don't arrive at this through self-condemnation. We don't arrive at this true encounter with Christ even through self-analysis. As I will point out to them or to you, because some of you are already here tomorrow morning, it is a great wisdom of our tradition that we never self-analyze. We never self-condemn, we never self-judge. Because at the heart of our tradition is not the focus on me, it is the focus on Christ. This is how we arrive at this awareness. Not by looking at me and trying to tear myself down, but rather by looking at Him. Let us draw even closer to our faith, and this is the final part of my talk. It is only in faith that we have a sense of the presence of God in the center of our lives. And everything I said so far has everything to do with it. The scriptures identify the location of the crucifixion, by the way, just to remind you, as the center of the world. We hear many times in the hymns that the Lord was crucified in the center of the world. Our liturgical life places, by the way, the cross in the middle of land, as you know very well. Why this central position of the cross? Because everything we have said so far, I have said so far, is an aspect of the cross. And this is what the Lord told his disciples when he said, I quote, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what will a man give in return for his life? Therefore, our entire life, the true life I already talked about, depends on the cross or on the incorporation of the cross into our lives. Indeed, the true decisive moments of our life are only in our struggles with brokenness, frailty, suffering, and death, we have to admit. In other words, with our own uh, brokenness and frailty. Moreover, only my facing of suffering and death happens at the deepest level of my being. My moments of happiness can never reach that depth. They will always betray their shallowness in front of the moments when I struggle with pain. And this is one reason for which we always chase happiness, because we want it to measure to the level of our pain, and it cannot. Therefore, it is precisely the moments of suffering and death that I encounter Christ and my eternal foundation in Him hangs on this question. What do I do with the fact that I am a creature of powerlessness, a creature in pain, and a mortal creature? Do I accept or do I reject my suffering? Do I see my life as my own? Better yet, do I see it as God taking flesh in me or as something alien to me and to God? If I accept my suffering, if I come to the proper a relationship to my pain and death, I conquer God. And I not only see myself clue, but I see my entire life clue, inscribed in God, or better yet, I see God inscribed in it. I see that Christ worked His own divine life in the tears and dark corners and the rot and the pain that my life is. This, by the way, Elder Emilianos says, means that I no longer see Christ as my executioner, but as my savior. And here is a quote. The moment we accept death, true life can begin. Only by means of death can one trample down death and so attain to resurrection. Thus, depending on how one con confronts the problem of suffering, God will be either his Savior or his executioner. 
Again, the secret to his freedom does not lie in the rejection of his sufferings, but in his joyful acceptance of them. He will be truly free only when he lets go of wanting to be free from his sufferings. For all freedom and all life depend on our being in the right relation to God. When he accepts his death, when he allows himself to hear the sound of his footsteps descending into the grave, he will find that death no longer has a hold on him, for now he is with God. The darkness will vanish, and he will see only light." End quote. The elder says freedom because we are truly free, not when we get rid of our suffering and our powerlessness, but when we let go of the desire to be rid of them. Like David, and this is the song that I will quote short, shortly, I learned that my walk in the midst of the shadow of death is my evening stroll with God in the garden of my life. That the beatings of my life have been God's comforting rod and staff. These beatings, which are so close to my skin, to my heart, that they seem to constitute my very being, they are actually God's embraces. The run of my life, the entire run, all the way through to the end, will doubtlessly be a heart by God's mercy. And of course, now like David, I learned that I spent my whole life feeling like God does not hear me. Not because that has truly been the case, but rather because, and I quote the elder again, if I exist, God cannot exist for there cannot be two gods. It is either God or my own self. When someone sees only his own suffering, God cannot answer him. For it is precisely the mistaken negative attitude towards suffering that constitutes a separation between him and God. But if I ceases to exist, and I am petition marks, if my relation to my suffering changes, forgive you, then I can be united to God. This union depends on the denial of myself so that God can come into my life." End quote. To the extent to which my ego dies, God will be revealed as the one who has been shepherding me all along. And here is the psalm that you may know in different translations. This is my own. The Lord shepherds me, and I will lack nothing. In a place of pasture, there he has made me tabernacle. He has raised me up by water and rest. He has turned my soul back. He has led me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. For even though I walk in the midst of the shadow of death, I will not hear bad things, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, these have comforted me. You have prepared a table in front of me, in front of those who afflict me. You have anointed my hand with oil and your cup, inebriated me as one which is most strong. And your mercy will pursue me closely all the days of my life. And my dwelling is in the house of the Lord to length of days. In his readjusted attitude, David's suffering makes sense to him and reveals God to him and unveils God in him. The very suffering and what he struggled with critically minutes earlier before the psalm is now revealed as the inebriated and overrunning cup of God's mercy. This is the content of the gospel the mystery of the cross, and this is the joy of Pascha, with which the saints live constantly and the true substance of human life. This is our help, the change of mind of the Christian. As the same contemporary church father explains, Elder Milanos, quote, in the end, we can say that our whole life is a passion play a history of extended suffering. However, 
Let us not lose sight of the deeper meaning offered to us by the psalmist, and he speaks of this psalm. Pain, difficulties, misfortunes, and suffering in general are the signs of divine visitation. Those who suffer are the special children of God. And so, when our life is untroubled and things seem to be going well, we should stop and we should ask ourselves if we have not somehow moved away from God, because it is precisely suffering that constitutes our glory, our crown." End quote. You probably have heard many say that the cross is the foundation of the world, and this idea is explained in many ways. Today I am submitting to you that there is something much greater here in front of us, the cross does not just keep the world going because it shows the love of God for us, or rather because it is God's embrace of us. The cross, furthermore, is the encompassing and the substance of the world. Remember how I already mentioned that the substance of our liturgy is the sacrifice of God Himself. Well, it is also the substance of our life and of everything which surrounds us. Christ is all things in all, says St. Paul. And this is what is hidden in the quote I used earlier when the, world, when the Lord Himself refers to our cross. After all, cross is something that belongs to Him. And nevertheless, He says, your cross, in other words, our cross. He says that what is His is, is also mine. It is all red and white. What depends on me is not to make the cross happen in my life, but what depends on me is whether I drag the cross behind me or I pick it up. This means, by the way, that my life is what He Himself experiences. The Lord keeps incarnating into our own lives, meeting His own life into us, his conception, his birth, his thirst and hunger, his suffering, his death and his resurrection. He is in us in all things but sin. He is our suffering. This extraordinary thing is exposed by Saint Paul when he says that, I quote, I complete in me what lacks in Christ, end quote. Not only do we fear and see that Christ's suffering and our suffering are one and the same thing, but we also experience that in our suffering, Christ fulfills his own life. Now you see why I chose the Psalm verse for the title of my talk, I hope. But you, O Lord, you gave up your Christ. The question of whether the Christ, the one that is given up by God, is the Lord Jesus, or I myself, is a wrong question. God slays Himself so that His life and my slain life are one and the same thing. And this is an embrace of all people and of all things throughout time. It's a gathering of all of us. This is where we are truly one in our faith. As we are each taken up into Christ like this, we are all gathered together from previously scattered lives into one broken body and one shed blood. And this is also the substance of the world to come. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Be able to open the book of questions? Of course, please. I prefer.